has allowed this wicked slaughter to take place. We acknowledge that we have not executed your laws and judgments, nor have we implemented your justice and righteousness. Stand with us in the lintel, Patcha, for, Lord, we declare our earnest desire to take a stand. Tell us what it is you would have us to do. What saith the Lord to his servants? Let us draw close to you so that you may draw close to us and that we may hear from your Holy Spirit. Please, O Lord, hear our cry. Hear the despair of our hearts. Hear our hopelessness in what we see. For the enemy rails at us and shows its strength daily. Having been trained in spiritual warfare, we go to the unseen. We understand that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Guide and direct us. Give us wisdom and understanding to overcome this wicked, evil, satanic entity. Honor us, O Lord, with your presence and with your guidance. Make your power and authority manifest in us. Without it, O Lord, we are fully lost and destroyed. The merchants of the earth have polluted us with products made from our own children that were willingly sacrificed to demons. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us where we have partaken of the table of demons, either knowingly or unknowingly. Forgive your people, O Lord, that have partaken in abortions. O Lord, forgive our people for any and all parts that we have made that we may have played in this wickedness. Cleanse us, O Father, our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. Cleanse us with the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Our wives and daughters have partaken of birth control and killed many of your servants, and many a husband's son have loved to have it so. Cause the hearts of the mothers to be turned back to their children, as it was for the children's hearts to be turned back to the fathers in Malachi 4.6. May your people heed your warning lest you come and smite the earth with a curse. Gracious, merciful, loving, heavenly Father, send your ministering angels to make those expectant mothers realize that they know not what they do when they even consider abortion. Remove the crust that has been placed there by the world and that has hardened their hearts. Remove the scales from their eyes and unstop their ears. Break the spell that is over the land. Reach down deep into their souls and allow the Holy Spirit-inspired words of the Christian pro-life protesters to resonate with these women, these women walking towards the clinics, this day and every day thereafter, so that they will turn back and not enter. Lord, we pray that you and your angels would bring destruction and a curse upon those that are planned parenthood and upon all those that seek the destruction of true Israel, your race, your people as well as all of those that operate, fund, and contribute to the abortion industry and its like programs. If there be any of your people in their midst, O Lord, we ask you to call them out, and if they answer not, then deal with them as you see fit. Lord Jesus, in your name, let us come against all this evil wickedness, those that stand against and that seek the destruction of your people. We beseech to call upon your mighty angels to remove the pollution from this land from your land, America, this new J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. Hear us, O Lord, and hear the innocent blood crying out. In Jesus' name, amen. time for Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. All around the world, from the United States to Canada, Europe, Russia, South Africa, Australia, the Holy Spirit is stirring the hearts of godly Christians. The Bible says, quote, as an eagle stirreth up his nest, end quote. We invite you to stay tuned as Pastor Peter J. Peters shines the mighty light of the gospel on the source of our problems and the only solution. Please keep Scriptures for America in your prayers. And now, Pastor Peters. It's time for Truth for the Times with Pastor Peter J. Peters. Truth for the Times will give you new insight, knowledge, and understanding of the times. This program may not be politically correct, but it is biblically correct. 
you heard the lies and deceptions of the day, now it's time for the truth. However, we must warn you, due to the nature of truth and man, this program could be offensive, shocking, and even frightening. But remember, the truth sets free and changes not. And this truth for the Times broadcast could very well change your life. So take time for this truth for the Times broadcast for Pastor Peter J. Peters. You know, someone once said that if you take God out of science, you end up with a story about evolution. If you take the mighty counselor out of counseling, you end up with Freudian psychology type counseling. But what happens to history if you take God out of history? You do not get the truth. Someone once said that history is his story. And it's about time the truth is told about his story, his hand in America. And this book, the Light and the Glory tells a portion of that story of America's history. And I am delighted to tell you that we are going to be blessed in this broadcast with an interview with the co-author of this book, Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall is a Presbyterian minister evangelist. He's the son of Dr. Peter Marshall and Catherine Marshall. Many of you have known of those two people by the book and the movie called A Man Called Peter. Dr. Peter Marshall was the chaplain of the Senate for many years. Peter Marshall, our co-author and guest, the co-author, I should say, of The Light and the Glory, as well as some other writings which you'll find out in this broadcast, but our guest is a graduate from Yale University. He got his Bachelor of History there, and he's also a graduate of Princeton, where he got his um, Master of Divinity. He lives on Cape Cod, where he used to pastor a church there for about 10 years, but since 1977 he's been traveling all across America, telling the, his story, if you will, of his hand, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's hand in the history of America. And we are fortunate enough to have Peter in the area. He's speaking at a Christian school, a fundraising, and I was fortunate enough to find out about it and he's here on this Truth for the Times broadcast. And Peter Marshall, thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. It's, it's good to be with you. It's exciting. And I'm not, I'm not kidding anybody. Now, here's two books. When I say that Light and Glory is a book I know, it's one of my favorites. This is, this is a new one. This is the one I use. Well, you can see it's pretty dog-eared, Peter. You've been through it a few times. <laughs> and I'm going to do this right on air, if you don't mind. I'd like to have your autograph. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, it's a real privilege. You can see that I marked it up. And, yeah. You bet. It's uh, this book, The Light and the Glory. I have talked about that for years, and when I read that story, uh, the stories in it, it just well, it's exciting to me to have you here. Well, I'm glad to do it. I, you know, what you were saying about uh, history being his story is is uh, tremendously important right now in this nation, Peter, because uh, we're, we're in a time when we Americans have totally lost the truth about our our Christian heritage about the answer to the question on the bottom of this uh, jacket cover, did God have a plan for America? That's the key question. How did, first of all, how many books are out? Well, it's over a million copies now, uh, Peter. It's a, the sequel from Sea to Shine Sea that we published in 86, picks up where Gloria leaves off, is, is uh, way up to hundreds of thousands also, and we're writing the third one. Over a million copies, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been see it was published in 1977, a long time ago. So a lot of people have read it. How did you get started? I mean, it's it's a phenomenal well, book, but how did you get started? I was when I went into the ministry. I had uh, I'd been a history major at Yale, as you indicated, and had taken courses in history simply because I loved it. I had no idea what I was going to do with it, and I had not given my life to the Lord back then at Yale. So I graduated from Yale, summer of '61 with no idea why I was living. Came out here to Colorado, as a matter of fact, Peter, to a Fellowship of Christian Athletes conference, Estes Park, and uh, the old YMCA campgrounds up there. Yeah. And the main speaker was a young Presbyterian minister by the name of Don Moomaw. And uh, I gave my life to the Lord with Don Moomaw one night. I, I was a head believer. You know, I'd been raised with a strong Marshall family background, but had resisted surrendering to Jesus for years. And uh, finally was desperate because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And that summer after graduation from college, the Lord got my attention through my desperation to get some guidance, some, some kind of direction in my life. Gave my life to the Lord that week. Three weeks later, 
uh, Peter, the Lord had me headed for Princeton Seminary. I mean, you don't get any graduate school in August, you know, for, for the next month. But the Lord did that for me because that's where he wanted me. And I went through Princeton Seminary, got filled with the Holy Spirit halfway through uh, in, a, in a prayer group there on a seminary campus and felt led after that to go into the gospel ministry, uh, which I've been in ever since. But I was pastoring a church on Cape Cod, I live now, little church on the north side of the Cape back in 75. Gave a talk at a nearby Christian community one night. We talked about this in the first pages of The Light and the Glory. And talked about Christopher Columbus being, being a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. The occasion was the, the evening prior to the first National Day of Prayer that had been called for by a U.S. president since Dwight Eisenhower. It uh, been a long time since a president had called for that for the American people. And I think it was uh, during the Watergate thing, actually. And uh, so it was appropriate that we be called to prayer. And I, I had been speaking to these people the evening before about America having a Christian background and uh, talked about Columbus's Christianity, talked about the pilgrims and Puritans coming to New England. This was in Massachusetts, of course, there on Cape Cod. Coming there originally not so much for freedom of worship, but to evangelize the Indians and to found a Christian commonwealth based on the Bible. And my co-author, David Manuel, was in the audience, and he was just shocked, as I had been, to hear these things. Because none of us have read any of this in our schooling. It wasn't in our textbooks. Never heard of it. No, we, none of us were raised this way. Because it has not been in America's history textbooks for almost 100 years now. You, you have to find people in their 90s today that are living, you know, that old, to find living Americans that know anything about it at all, Peter. So... I said these things. David came up to me afterward and said, gee, I wonder if we're supposed to do a book together about all this. And I, you know, I was negative. I poo pooed the thing. I was pastoring a church and traveling, preaching around the country sometimes. And I, you know, I didn't really want to do this. But he insisted we pray about it. And I didn't really want to pray about it even because I was afraid the answer would be yes. You know, but sure enough, we did pray about it. And the Lord led us. And I got excited about it. I got totally committed to it. Because that very first day in Boston, we ended up in Boston Public Library, and later the Lord opened up for us to do research at Yale, which we were both, we were both Yale graduates, at Harvard, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. But that first day, even just with the Library of Congress, or excuse me, the public library in Boston, which is huge, we found enough evidence that just that first day to know that we were really on to something. And uh, our book literally fell off the shelf into David's hand, uh, for example, we were just browsing, you know, looking for anything. Lord, are you in this? Is this something you want us to do? Is there any evidence? I mean, sure, if this is your project, show us something. The book literally fell off the shelf into David's hand. He started looking through it. It happened to be a book uh, in a series of books called The Pageant of America. Uh, Luther Weigel, who was an old professor at Yale in the 20s, as a matter of fact, was the editor of this thing. Old series of books. And uh, he was flipping through one of them, came to a picture of two monks preaching to Indians, staring in a long house, you know, dressed in long Jesuit robes. And uh, he looked at the caption, it said, Marquette and Joliet preaching to the Indians. Well, he had never known that Marquette and Joliet were monks. All he had ever known was they discovered the Mississippi. Uh -huh. Well, the reason they discovered the Mississippi was <laughs> they were paddling around evangelizing Indians. I mean, that's what they were doing there in the first place. They didn't come to America to explore. They came to minister to the Indians. And that was news to him, news to me too, for that matter. So there was one clue. Uh, this, the whole book project, The Light of the Glory of Peter, was like a giant treasure hunt. It was like the Lord would lead us from clue to clue to clue to clue. It went like that. I remember in the book, you said it suddenly became like a treasure hunt, and it's so exciting yeah. because you found one thing after right. another. Well, we prayed our way through it because we knew we were dependent on the guidance, the guidance of God. I mean, here's a book which is 384 pages, I think it was. And we're talking about from Christopher Columbus through the presidency of George Washington. We're talking about 350 years of uh, American history. Well, how do you, you know, how do you cover 350 years in 384 pages? I mean, it's ridiculous. And the answer is you only do it by prayer and guidance from God. I mean, about what to write about, what is, you know, what was really significant, what's most important. And so that's what this is. It's not a history textbook, because we're storytellers, and uh, it's a narrative 
really of God's hand in our past, the miracles he, wrote, he, he, he wrought, and who the people really were here, the, the, the names we all know, but it turns out we know next to nothing about their Christian faith, about who they really were, about how God used them, about what they really did, what they said. You know, the founding fathers, just to take them, for example, in America, Peter wrote over 100,000 volumes. 100,000 volumes. Amazing. And most Americans have never read any primary source document written by any of them. Let's get to some of the contents of the book. And ladies and gentlemen, we could spend the whole hour just dealing with the stories of the book. And I want Peter Marshall to tell us some of the stories. But I also wanted to cover some of the, uh, Peter, some of the, the, the philosophies. Like, sure. For example, like the pilgrims. Uh, we'll take that portion of the book. I, I marked some. Now, I want you to tell the people about the sufferings. Uh, some people have heard about the sufferings and the hardships. Not the true story by any means. But so few have heard anything about their philosophy as, as Christians. Well, they were deeply committed Christians, Peter. Um, the hardships immediately comes to mind. William Bradford, the great governor, um, most, most American school children for the last couple of generations have had to read portions, at least, of his of Plymouth Plantation. It's a great classic. That's he is the great governor of Plymouth. Magnificent Christian, spiritual giant in American history. And that's his record, his memoirs, if you will, of what life was like there, why they came, and so forth. And at the end of that book, Peter, William Bradford, looking back, sums it up by saying, We have noted these things, things we're going to talk about here. We have noted these things so that you, the reader, might see their worth and not negligently lose that your fathers have obtained with such hardship. Well, and that's exactly what we've done, isn't it? Exactly. We have lost what our fathers have obtained with such hardship, or we are losing it rapidly. That's why I feel this call of God on my life and David Mariano's life so important, to help modern Americans recover the truth. Because very simply put, Peter, if we don't know who we're supposed to be, if we don't have some understanding of God having a plan for this nation, we don't know who we are. We don't know why we're here. The basic problem in America is we've lost our sense of destiny and purpose. We've lost our national identity. But if we don't know who we're supposed to be, we don't know how to fix things. If we don't have any sense of, of America being called to be uh, a self-governing experiment in putting into practice the biblical principles of how human beings are supposed to live together, the only self-governing republic in world history, the only one, if we don't know that, then we're ready to fall for all of the secularist, humanist propaganda that, that the unbelievers are, are pushing continually. Letters to the editor, uh, you know, bills in our state legislature, taking prayer, Bible reading out of public school, and on and on and on and on to the destruction of our society. If we don't know any of our Christian heritage, we're all too ready to fall for this kind of stuff. And, well, it's just a pluralistic society, basically secular, and you... You know, you just have to have all kinds, and you can't really have any kind of Christian or biblical standards anymore. And all. People swallow this stuff, and it's garbage, it's propaganda. But people will swallow it if they don't know our heritage. Particularly young people, they have nothing else to go by. They've never been taught any of it. Yeah. But our generation, Peter, has not been taught any of it either. Oh, I agree. I agree. So, I mean, so the parents of the kids now, are, both the parents and the kids, are ignorant. The grandparents know a little bit. My parents, our parents' generation knows a, knew a little bit. Of it. But they're dying off. But they're dying off, exactly. So th this is urgent. It's urgent. I believe in this nation, Peter, we may have less than five years left. It might be three, it might be seven or eight, before America becomes too sick to heal. You know, every civilization reaches the point of no return. Good point. And I, we've got every characteristic of the last days of the Roman Empire, every single one of them. And this time, Peter, the barbarians are not outside the gates we inside the gates. And if we don't get our heritage back, I think we're cooked. You know, we're like the frog in the beaker that, you know, slowly cooking to death before he knows it's hot. That's what's happening to us. So, we're in the last of the ninth inning, to borrow an image from my favorite sport. A lot of runs behind. But old Yogi Berra used to say, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't right. over yet. It ain't over yet. We've got a chance to turn this country around, but we've got to move quickly. I'm going to pause here, and ladies and gentlemen, I know many of you out there that are watching, and many on our tape ministry, and those that listen to us on the radio, homeschool their children. And fortunately, so many of them do use the light and the glory as a textbook. 
Well, I'll tell you how you can get the book, The Light and the Glory, and that is simply, here's the book, Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall and David Manuel. We've carried it for years on our ministry, and if you would like to have that book, you simply write to us, close an offering of $12, that covers the postage, to Truth for the Times, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. And if you want to call that number, that's our shortwave radio number, and there'll be a recording. You can just leave your name and address, and uh, we can get back with you then. Well, Peter, uh, you know, I had some notes, but I just love what you're saying. I, I'm all ears. Uh, I don't know what to talk about if, I'm, if I should talk about the philosophy. Some of the things I wrote down was these Christian people understood that Jesus was the head of the church and not, not the state or, or oh, the well, Peter, I think, you know, what comes to my mind is a, is a quote from Karl Marx, who's the father of communism, you know, who wrote a lot of lies, of course. One thing Marx said was very true, and the communists have always practiced it anywhere they've taken power, and it was this, take away the heritage of a people, and they are easily persuaded. Now, well, who said that? Karl Marx. Is that right? That's exactly what's been happening. Take away the heritage. And they are easily persuaded. And, and that's what's been happening in our schools for about 75 years, and in our homes, and in our churches, because we're ignorant of these things. So let's talk about what things we're ignorant of. For example, Christopher Columbus. Now, back in 1992, with the 500th anniversary, which was a real non-event in America, and Columbus bashing, you know, became the sort of new favorite indoor sport among so-called intellectuals in this country, and certainly in the state of Colorado, there's a lot of it. A lot of the uh, Native American lobbyists use the occasion to try to get points for themselves by bashing Columbus, he was portrayed, Americans were supposed to believe he was this white, dead white European male, you know, who raped this pristine, idyllic paradise of the Caribbean, people for these noble, sensitive, environmentally conscious, recycling Native Americans, you know, that Columbus was supposed to have invaded this pristine paradise uh, with three little ships and 90 men, that's an invasion, but we were supposed to believe that he invaded this paradise down there and that, you know, he didn't have that he slaughtered Indians by the hundreds of thousands and didn't have any Christianity about him. That's simply not true at all. He did make some mistakes down there. The Indians were enslaved at one point. Uh, but the reason, go back to that in a second, the reason Columbus sailed in the first place was that he was a missionary explorer, Peter, and wanted, planted a huge cross on the beach everywhere he landed. Christine, the first island he discovered in, San, in, in the Caribbean, San Salvador, Holy Savior, in an age where the people say, well, so what? The point is, the custom was, that age, for discoverers to name their discoveries after their backers, for the obvious reasons. Well, Ferdinand and Isabella, who back in the King and Queen of Spain, got their islands in the Caribbean, all right, but not until Jesus had gotten his first. This man was motivated by the Bible, Peter, not by geopolitical considerations of empire building, he was a brilliant Bible scholar, matter of fact, and a student of prophecy, soaked in the books of Isaiah, Daniel, and Revelation. He was the reason he wanted to go from the Caribbean was not for himself. He was only he only asked for ten percent of all the wealth he would discover, which you know isn't really greed. That's that's not a definition of greed in my book. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason he wanted the gold, Peter, was for Spain to finance one last great crusade to recover the Holy Land from the Muslims and actually rebuild Solomon's temple on its old site in Jerusalem. That burned him. He wanted to evangelize the world for Christ. Now, let me tell you a story that's not in the light of the glory, because I learned it afterward. Fascinating story out of this man's background. It seems that in the year 1315, there was a famous Franciscan missionary, a monk, missionary to the Muslims by the name of Ramon Lull, L-U-L-L -L or L-L-U-L, -L, they spell it differently, who was ministering Jesus to the Muslim babes of what is today Algeria, the port city of Bouja, northern coast of Africa. He had been there once before. They'd run him out of town, almost killed him. He knew he was taking his life in his hands going back there. And he was 80 years old, for heaven's sake. They had begged him to retire somewhere. He had refused, saying he had to go one more time to Bouja. He stood on the steps of the mosque, and denounced Islam as a false religion, saying Jesus Christ is the only true mediator between God and man. The Muslims needed to repent of their sins, give their lives to Jesus Christ, and believe in the gospel. Well, the Muslims didn't want to hear this 
from this man. And he finally stoned him one day, Peter, and left him to die, broken and bleeding alone at the foot of the mosque steps. Now, by one of those coincidences that we Christians know perfectly well are not one bit coincidental, there were a couple of merchants in port from Genoa in Italy. They'd been trading with these Muslims. They'd finished their business. They were getting ready to sail home, and they heard that Blessed Ramon Lal had been stoned. Everybody had, throughout Christendom knew this man, famous missionary. So they ran to the square and found him dying there, at the foot of the steps, picked him up, took him back to their ship, and sailed for home. As obvious he was dying, but the plan was to bury him in Genoa, and they got there, believing that if this saint of God were buried in their city, God would bless the whole city, because he was buried there. Uh -huh. But the winds of the Mediterranean blew him off course, and they ended up off the island of Mallorca the middle of the Mediterranean, which just coincidentally again, quote-unquote, happened to be Ramon Lull's birthplace. And they would have blown him home to see the island of his birth before he died. Amazing story. Barely alive. He has to see the place. They brought him up on deck, lifted him up over the railing. The last strength he had left, he lifted up his arm, pointed to the western horizon, and said, beyond this sea, washes this continent we know. There lies another continent we've never seen. Whose natives are ignorant of Christ, send men there. And he died. And the two men were kneeling beside him to hear this famous missionary's last words, which you and I would have done. You know, what is he going to say at the end? Huh? Right. One of those men who God told that story to his family came down through his bloodline from generation to generation to generation. Man's name, Peter, was Stefano Colombo, Stephen Columbus. He was the ancestor of Christopher Columbus. So Christopher Columbus grew up hearing from his dad and granddad over and over. Right. One, of the, one of the men that heard him say that? Yeah. Well, yes. one, of those, one of those merchants heard those dying yes. words. The ancestor of Christopher. And went, it, was the, it was Columbus's ancestor. And it came down to his family. See, Christopher means Christ bearer. And Columbus believed God had given him that name because that was God's call in his life, to take the light of Christ, as the Pope put it in a letter to the King and Queen of Spain west to the heathen of undiscovered lands. That was what was burning in it. So here, we know nothing of this. You know, all we know is some of the mythology about Columbus, and some of it's wrong, for example. He wasn't rejected by half the courts in Europe because, because the people in Europe believed the world was flat. That's part of the mythology. Everybody with education knew perfectly well the world was round. The Bible says the world is a sphere, for heaven's sake. The Greeks had proved it mathematically before Christ. The reason they rejected him was because they thought it was too impossible, it was too expensive, he could never pull it off, they'd all die. I mean, you know, it was ridiculous. So they rejected him. But Columbus kept his tremendous example to modern Christians of somebody who persevered through rejection, sneering, jeering, you know, complete personal rejection at these courts. And he was, he was a foreigner. He wasn't even English or Portuguese or Spanish or French or whatever. He was Genoese from what would become Italy. So all, all alone, by himself, absolutely alone, he perseveres with the vision that Jesus had birthed in his heart. And look how God used him. Now he made some mistakes. He's a sinner like the rest of us. But the point is he had a vision. And, and the point is, is that vision. story that has been told by Hollywood and other sources is not good. Oh, well, well, he was, the movies came out in 1992 portraying this some kind of swashbuckling ancestor of Earl Flynn kind of person. That was ludicrous. You know, had him leaping around quarter deck, sword in hand. That was dumb. I don't know where to go, but you mentioned something about uh, they saw coming to America's fulfillment of prophecy. On page 266, one thing I noticed was, uh, of all people, a lawyer, uh, William Livingston. He said, uh, this was during the time of the War for Independence, he said, quote, Courage, Americans, the finger of God points out a mighty empire to your sons. The savages of the wilderness were never expelled to make room for idolaters and slaves. The land we possess is the gift of heaven to our fathers, and divine providence seems to have decreed it to our latest posterity. Now, this is just one of several quotes where the people, even at the time of George Washington, saw the events that were taking place uh, as basically fulfillment of prophecy. Oh, heavens, yes. But, but, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting point, Peter, because, you see, they had been taught in their own upbringing, they had been taught about the miracles of God in their own four, American forefathers' lives. In other words, Americans seem to have the idea today that the idea about America 
just kind of suddenly popped into people's consciousness in 1776. It didn't start in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. It really started, spiritually speaking, in 1620 at Plymouth with the Pilgrims. Because the, the Pilgrims did not come to America, contrary to what we all taught here, the Pilgrims did not come to America for freedom of worship. All of us were taught they came here for religious freedom. These are the phrases you learned in school, right? Religious freedom or freedom of worship. That's what all of us were taught. It's not true. Simple reason. They already had it. They had 12 years of religious freedom in Holland. They were English refugees that had fled for their very lives from religious persecution in England, Peter. But if freedom of worship was all was about, they could have stayed in Holland, worshiped freely forever. They said they were brought to America by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to, quote, propagate the gospel among the Indians, which they did, by the way, and to become stepping stones for the furtherance of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Those were the missionaries. Well, not only that, uh, you show in, in your book, with the Mayflower Compact and the other things that you show there, right. they, they actually saw it as a mission for the kingdom of Christ. Oh, absolutely. It, this was the first and only time, with the possible exception of the first Boers, the first Dutch into, German Dutch into, into South Africa, who never fully developed the vision that they'd had. But the really basically the only time, Peter, that Christian men and women had the opportunity to found a whole new society based on the biblical principles of self-government. That's what America is. We're a self-governing republic. We're not a democracy, as I'm sure you've said many times with this broadcast. Yes. We are a republic, and the only one founded on these biblical principles, where we had an opportunity to start from scratch, so to speak, and create this whole new society, a just... The vision of birth America, Peter, is that of a just society, based on God's Word, where every single person would have the opportunity to reach his or her highest human potential, so that's what that's what the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness are about in America. It's not a life of hedonism. That's not what happiness means. It means the chance to fulfill your own. Per it's not a life of hedonism. That's not what happiness means. It means the chance to fulfill your own personal destiny at God's hands under His guidance. Now the pilgrims and Puritans who followed them in much greater numbers, right, right immediately thereafter, the pilgrims and Puritans had that vision firmly, firmly worked into their hearts because of their own personal experience with Jesus. And they came as a covenanted people. They weren't a bunch of individualists just coming for, for gold and glory, you know. But they came for God. And the point was, they weren't coming alone. They were, they were driven together. The saints and strangers that the Mayflower started with on the other side of the Atlantic were welded together into a company of Christian believers by the sufferings they went through on the village and the first months in the new world. These people came because of Christ. They came to evangelize the Indians, and they did that. They were Plymouth with a 50-year unbroken peace treaty with the Rapha Moron under Chief Massasoit. And the incredible thing is how the Pilgrims actually, this humble group of, of simple English yeoman farmers, nothing extraordinary about them at all in terms of any human credentials, but they, they were wonderfully given and yielded and surrendered to Jesus. They were serious Christians. They were nominal churchgoers. They're really serious about living in Jesus. And God used them to lay the foundations of this great nation. Because our whole understanding of government, of the freedom of the Christ-centered individual, and the covenant commitment that we Americans have through the Bill of Rights, for example, a secular expression of the, I believe, the Constitution of the United States, basically it's a Puritan document, Peter. In 1641, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, that the Puritans drew up was written by Nathaniel Ward of Ipswich, Massachusetts. Ninety-eight propositions that codified, put into law, the, the laws for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Ninety-eight, ninety-eight of them. But here's what's interesting. This is a this is 1641. Right? This is 136 years before the Constitution of the United States is written. Mm -hmm. Among the 98 propositions, Peter, are those that protected life, liberty, and property. I've already heard that before. It said that it was a violation of common law to impose taxation without representation. I've already heard that before. So that every citizen had a right to a trial by a jury of one's peers. I've already heard that before. It forbade cruel and unusual punishment. I've already heard that before. I mean, on and on and on. Phrases that would appear verbatim, word for word, here in the Constitution of the United States, 146 years later. So you heard it is in Massachusetts, written down, word for word. Now what that tells us is, 
the, Const the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, were not a product of some kind of British or French Enlightenment secular philosophy for some genius like Jefferson. Exactly. Jefferson, by the way, said, he said, there's nothing new in the Declaration. I simply put down on paper the popularly held ideas of the time. Great. All of, see, 75 percent, three quarters of the American people in 1775 were from the Reformed traditions of the Christian faith. They'd all been raised on a strong Calvinism that had taught that people are not required to submit to tyranny by the religion of Jesus Christ but may make use of such powers as God has given them to defend their, their liberties and their rights. That's a direct quote. You know, Calvin and Calvinism had taught for a couple of hundred years before the Declaration of Independence, literally a couple of hundred years, that Christian people are to live according to biblical principles and establish a just and free society, and that they are not required to submit to tyranny. And so... You know, when 1776 rolled around, what was happening was a conservative, last-ditch resort to arms to safeguard the freedoms they'd always had. It had been 400 years, well, longer than that, six, seven hundred years tradition in England that the parliament could never impose taxes without people being represented, without the people represented in the parliament okaying those taxes. So in 1776, we had no representation in Parliament whatsoever. Americans were not represented. We had no representatives there. So it was totally illegal, totally illegal, totally unconstitutional, a violation of literally hundreds of years of English constitutional law for Parliament to impose taxes on the American people, the American colonies. So when all we were doing was simply protesting this and saying, you cannot legally do this, you're violating all the rights of Englishmen for hundreds and hundreds of years. So there was nothing revolutionary about it here. This was not a revolution. We were simply resorting to arms because we had to, to protect our God-given rights and freedoms. But our forefathers, they left us alone to establish our own laws. So the foundation of America goes way, way back, Peter. Not 1776, but 1620. So the tradition, the basic traditions of the American people, are a free and just society, based on obedience to God, a covenant relationship with Him, whereby He would promise to make us an example to the rest of the world of the possibilities of life on this planet, because the principles in that book, sitting on that table that we call the Bible, the principles in that book are universal. They apply to all people, no matter what color their skin is, no matter what age they live in, no matter what country they're born and raised in, those principles are universal. That's right, is right. Who you are, where you are. And, and the point is, America is called to be a city upon a hill. President Reagan loved that phrase because it comes from Governor John Winthrop, the first governor of Massachusetts, quoting Jesus, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, Ben Elliott, who was the chief speechwriter in the Reagan administration for the first uh, six years of those two administrations, loved the light and the glory. He kept feeding President Reagan phrases from it in his speeches which is why Reagan would often quote things that are that were very familiar to all of us Americans, a kind of our tradition. Reagan had this tremendous understanding, I believe, of what America's all about. He really had the vision in his heart. He understood it, which is why he was able to communicate to the American people so, so easily and so clearly. Now he's a great communicator. But the point is that, that America is called to be an example to other people in the rest of the world, Peter, of the possibilities of life on this planet because the principles that our fathers died for that were established in this nation from the beginning are universal biblical principles. They will, they will work anywhere. You know, uh, let's go to, uh, I'll get this to some stories because we're going to run out of time. Right. But of course, we, we when you read the book, you find out that it, the coming and landing of the pilgrims was not like we've been told that suddenly the first year they're going to starve they hadn't been for the Indians. There's a tremendous story there. Oh, can I tell a story? Go ahead. <laughs> that was <a> true story. <laughs> well, the first Thanksgiving, that we traditionally call the first Thanksgiving, or Kenneth, which was the fall of 1621, actually in October, happened like this. Back in 1605, which was 15 years before the pilgrims would show up, the Patuxent Indians lived on the site of Kenneth. That was their tribal village. The, the English had been operating fishing expeditions off the coast of New England, and in 1605, one of the captains was under orders to bring back to England half a dozen Indians from the New England coast because 
the English were about to plan the colonization of North America. They wanted to, to teach the Indians the English language and then quiz them, query them about the location of the various Indian tribes on the coast, which were hostile and which were friendly, so they could cite the colonies next to the friendly tribes, which was a shrewd idea. Yeah. But it, it worked beautifully. There was an Indian brave, a so half a dozen Patuxets, including this Indian brave by the name of Squanto, or Tisquantum, was his Patuxet name, were taken on board this English fishing boat, taken back to England. Squanto was taught the English language, like the rest, learned to speak, speak English fluently, and lived nine years being in this fishing captain's home. So obviously, he learned to eat English foods, and he learned English customs and ways, and the language. Right. And the English got the information from him they wanted, by the way, as they taught these Indians the English language. The end of nine, nine years, 1614 now, Squanto was brought back home on another fishing expedition, this one under the command of Captain John Smith, who had escaped from the debacle of Virginia. They, Virginia was not in Christ for years. They fought among themselves a lot when they went through a net. They had all of the Indians. You tell that story too. Yeah, you do. I mean, Pat Roberts and I have a little running thing about this, but Virginia didn't start off, you know, in quite the wonderful Christian enterprise that the propaganda said it was back in England. The reality is a little different. But, which is why, by the way, the, the Lord allowed, uh, I believe, the pilgrims to, to not end up under the authority of the Virginia colony, which was their original plan, which you tell in the book, too. That's right. And they were there, of course, and delayed by storms and all that. Ended up at Cape Cod, where I lived, and felt they were supposed to stay there. The Lord led them to the side of Plymouth. I'm getting ahead of my story. So Squanto was brought back home in 1614. Smith was in command of this expedition that let him off, and he, he was there with his people. While the English filled up the vessels with fish, and when time came for them to go home, take their fish back to England, Smith gave orders to one of his captains by the name of Thomas Hunt. He was supposed to stay behind and trade his cargo of fish for a cargo of beaver pelt, which would bring a lot more money in London than fish, obviously. And Smith and the rest sailed for home, leaving Hunt behind to do this. Well, as soon as they were out of sight, Hunt set about with a different plan of his own. Though it was fish, all right, but he tripped on board 20 unsuspecting Patuxet braves. Squanto among them, lying to them, telling them he was going to trade with them. He had no intention of doing that. Took them prisoner, great anchor, and set sail across Massachusetts Bay to the outer edge of Cape Cod. Stopped there and scooped up seven Nauset Indian men. Sailed for Europe. He's got 27 healthy Indian men on board. The cargo he's got in mind is slavery. His destination was Malaga, slave trading port on the south coast of Spain. And there, Squanto and the rest were put up on the auction block and sold as slaves. Now, try this for a coincidence. At the precise moment, Squanto was standing on the auction block being sold, a monk from a nearby monastery just happens to stroll by at that instant, right? Takes a look at this forlorn American Indian being sold, takes pity on him, buys him, takes him to the monastery, and leads him to Christ. Squanto lives with the monks for a year, he learns the Christian faith, there. After about a year or so, he obtains his freedom, works his way back up the coast of Europe, takes him several years to do this, till he get back to England. He lives in Captain Dermer's home until he can negotiate with Dermer passage back across the Atlantic in exchange for being their guide when they get to New England waters. So Dermer takes him along with him and dumps him off on the outer tip of Cape Cod, Promise Town, or Promise Town is today, and Squanto probably ran the 75 miles home. He was so happy to be home. But when he got there, he received the shock of his life, Peter, because he found that in the years he'd been away, a plague had come and killed every single Indian in the tribe. They were all dead. He was the only Patuxet left alive. Now, this was 1619, the year before the pilgrims were going to show up. He wanders among the ruins for a few days, then walks 50 miles southwest to the Wampanoag and the chief Massasoit, and Massasoit takes pity on him and takes him in. He stays with them for a year, 16 months, something like that, until March of 1621. He hears there's a bunch of English trying to live on the side of his old village. And the pilgrims had been through their first winter. They had met him there, and when they came ashore, there at the side of the old village, they found the ground cleared, four freshwater springs, nobody around. I mean, the Patuxet were all dead. They weren't able to buy the land from. They felt like God had prepared the place for them. And they'd be behind. But in March of 1621, 47 of them had died that first winter. Most of the young people left. Every family has lost at least one member. Some families have lost both parents. The, the teenage kids are just orphaned. I mean, these are English 
farmers. They've got no idea how, how to live in this New England wilderness. And the food they bought on Mayflower is gone. They're literally facing starvation now here. Squanto hears about their plight, walks back 50 miles to the side of his old bridge, suddenly discovered a reason to live. He teaches these poor English everything he, everything he knows of Indian law, what berries they can eat, how to trap eels in the mud flats of the bay when the tide goes out, which doesn't sound too appetizing to us, but if you're starving, they will take it. Most importantly, he taught them how to plant corn, which what the Indians lived on in the winter. They planted 20 acres of corn under his direction. In October, when the corn's ripe, they're going to have a Thanksgiving festival to thank the Lord for his deliverance through this American Indian who speaks perfect English, who understands English customs and ways, who eats English foods, and who is a committed Christian the way they are. Well, according to your book, just happened to wander into their camp yeah, and right. they couldn't even believe that it's like, how do you speak English? Who's going to believe that? The right man at the right place at the right time. Only God Almighty can do something like that. I mean, here he is shaped through years of suffering and slavery. And he ends up being right there when they need him. I mean, desperate, they're facing starvation, and he shows up to literally save their lives. So that 20 acres of corn, they want to have a celebration. Some say it was Squanto's idea, by the way. So they invite Massasoit, Mara of Upper Moab. He arrives a day early with 90 braves, all the women and all the children. And they're going to have to use all the corn they've just harvested to feed this mile of Indians that are, that are afraid. But they needn't have worried, Peter, because Massasoit had ordered it. You thought of that. He ordered his braves to hunt to the occasion. They came with five dressed venison, 12 wild turkeys, the Indian women with berry pies, Pilgrim women supplied the vegetables. They had a three-day celebration, feasting, uh, relay races, foot races, bow and arrow shooting contests. Miles Dandy shot off his basket. I mean, three days. Thanksgiving for most of us is afternoon and grass, you know. But they had three days of wonderful time together. And we believe the pilgrims must have stopped many times just to thank God for his absolute miraculous deliverance. Uh, I want to, uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, is that correct? And uh, there's a couple things I want to talk about. Well, there's so much I want to talk about. But, oh, no. uh, let's get to the time of the war for independence. One thing that stuck out in my mind was how the colonists had the idea. And, and the reason I'm saying this is I believe that if church people, a lot of them are sitting in their church pews pew, they're feeling like they're there's something missing. Mm -hmm. There of, is. Yeah, there is. There is. And if they start reading the story, they'll get a perspective of Christianity, I believe, that they never saw before. Absolutely. And that what these men saw was that God reigned on the throne. throne. Oh, no question. I'll give you a quote. The day the Declaration was voted, Peter, Samuel Adams, tremendous Christian patriot, father of the American Revolution, he's called, but a tremendous Christian. People don't know that wrote a tract before the war in which he'd said, for example, the rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the New Testament. There's a source of human rights for our fathers, the New Testament, not the Supreme Court. Now, Sam Adams, the day the Declaration was voted, closed the day by, by rising to his feet and speaking into that stunned silence as they were considering the coming war. He said this, We have this day restored the sovereign, capital S, in other words, restoring godly government in America. To whom alone men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting sun, may his kingdom come. And I, I love that. I got that in the line. Beautiful quote. And, it's, and then the, the next page says that when the, maybe, when the natives, when the colonists heard about it, the cannons went off, and they believed, I think it, you said in here, they looked at it as, as a, a decree from heaven. Absolutely. That this, that this was Christ, the sovereign, being established. Yes. Yes. Re-established. Re-established on the American seat of government. That, see, that's why Adams used the word restore. Very important word. Oh, I agree. See, because restore says that godly government had been the American tradition prior to the crown of the parliament usurping God's rightful place on the American throne, so to speak, seat of American government. So what they were doing by this Declaration of Independence was simply restoring godly government. That was their whole understanding, Peter. It was not a revolution. And, well, it's, that's turn the world upside down. Absolutely. That does revolve. But, but, but revolution really usually means overthrowing some established order. In and America, it was not rebellion, because rebellion right. is right. rejection of legitimate authority. Exactly. They were reestablishing 
And they Talk said, government. King, they said, government, you do not get above God's law. So no king but King, king Jesus. Was that, that was the battle cry. That was one of the great battle cries during that time. That's That's true. And we're, we're entering that era again where Christians are awake and saying, hey, well, the state says I can't spank, but my God says I better spank. Well, see, the, I, I believe, Peter, if the fathers were alive today, they would, I believe we're in the position of the early 1770s, once again. Where we, if the fathers were alive today and they looked at the federal government's usurpation of the Constitution of the United States, violation of that, intruding into areas that the Constitution says should be left to the states. The Constitution is crystal clear about the fact, and the fathers have great wisdom in doing this, that the federal government is supposed to stay out of all areas of American life, not explicitly given to it. Now, that means the federal government is wrongfully involved, in my opinion, in education, has no business being involved in health care, the, the environmental regulations are totally out of control. I mean, there's a long list of things that the fathers would have one word, a one word description for. One word, they would call all this tyranny. Tyranny. They would say, you've lost your self-government. You know, you're again under the tyranny of an overweening federal government that we wrote a constitution to prevent. Let me read a quote from the book. From the town of Marlboro, 1773, Massachusetts. Now, this was the Christianity of that day. Quote, A freeborn people are not required by the religion of Jesus Christ to submit to tyranny, but may make use of such power as God has given them to recover and support their laws and liberties. We implore the ruler above the skies that he would make bare his arm in defense of his church and people and that is real good. Good prayer to be praying right now, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I haven't even got to this. I cut this out of the USA today, yesterday. And this is about Yale. I don't know if you I'm sorry, I've not seen it. Uh, it's, uh, let me just read it real fast. Mm. In the realm of return gifts, this one is a whopper. Yale University said Tuesday it will return $20 million from a Texas philanthropist and 79 graduate, Lee Bass. You know? Uh, don't, but I bet my co well, no, he, well, he was well after our time. He was out 20 years ahead of Luke. For a, core, for a Western civilization course, the course focusing on European culture hasn't been implemented. And it goes on to talk about how the president, Richard Levine, uh, hasn't implemented the course because they want this multiculturalism. Oh, boy. And yep. And I thought you'd find that interesting. I find it very interesting and very, very sad. Um, send your children to Hillsdale, folks, in Michigan. That's, you can't get out of there without passing a, a court uh, curriculum in Western Civilization classics. The point I want to address here is it's almost like there's a conspiratorial effort. There's no question about it. it, it it's, not, it's not so much that people are gathering in a smoke filled room somewhere and saying, let's get, let's, you know. But, <laughs> They don't need to do that. You don't have to have a bunch of, when we say the word conspiracy, we think of people sitting around a table plotting something. That's not the way this works. The problem is they all think alike. They don't have to get together in one room. They all think alike. We've got, we've got people that have been so brainwashed by a secularist, humanist education. And I was a, I, it was beginning to happen at Yale when I was there in the late 50s and early 60s. And it's full blown now, believe me. I wouldn't send one of my kids to Yale for love or money. And I love the place, but uh, and the but the only fighters of Yale be turning their graves if they knew it was happening. Harvard, it's not just Yale, Harvard, Princeton, Dartmouth. I mean, University of Michigan, Penn, you name it. it the, higher education in America has been totally taken over by this secularist worldview, which rejects the role of God not only in American history but in science and everywhere else. Well, yeah, it also doesn't it reject the Western European. Uh, yes, it, it, it was founded on the Bible. Western civilization is biblically based. You cannot teach Western civilization. Any department, I don't care what you're talking about, architecture, art, literature, science. Science comes from, from the Bible, for heaven's sake. It's that, it's that exploration of God's universe, that, that, that the fact that God created this, that fueled that kind of exploratory desire and urge in people. Science is directly descended from Scripture. It all comes from the Bible. Well, we got so much we agree on, no sense of addressing some disagreements. I, I kind of disagree. I think that there is an actual conspiracy. But that's neither here nor there. The, the bottom line is the fruit is there. Well, the point is they all think alike. 
and we're not getting the truth out. Right. And we don't have a lot of time left on this TV right. slash broadcast getting the truth out, but we've got a few minutes left. What's the what can we do? Okay, good question, Peter. And that, that, that's the bottom line here. Yeah. What are we going to do about this? Okay, I've got two answers. But I really believe with all my heart these are the only two things that are going to work. First of all, we've got to get back to the original American vision. Because if we said, it, as I said at the top of the broadcast, if we don't know who we're supposed to be, we don't know how to fix things. Nehemiah had to have a plan for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. All right, there had to be a blueprint, a plan. The blueprint is in our own history. When Isaac was going through the land of the Philistines, he redug his father's wells for water. So we've got to redig our father's wells. Good biblical image. The bottom of our father's wells there's good pure truth, just like at the bottom of Abraham's wells there was good pure water. We've got to redig our father's wells. Got to get back to vision. Second thing we've got to do, critically important, this is the crucial thing, most important thing of all, the Christian people in this nation have got to put Second Chronicles seven fourteen into practice. Because we have, but now that's all through scripture, obviously, God calls on people to repent. But Second Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name, that's the believers, not the whole population now, the Christians within the population, any population, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves before we get humbled, and will pray and seek my face, which is more than going to church once a week, and thirdly, most importantly, Peter, God says, if my people will turn from their wicked ways, the ways of self, half-hearted commitments, living just to be prosperous, be successful, you know, half-hearted commitment to Jesus and to one another on my own. If my people will turn from their wicked ways, God promises I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. That's such a good scripture. We have to read it on the Second Chronicles 7. There it is. Read it, will you? If my people, the believers now, who are called by my name, Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Scripture calls continually for seeking his face in prayer. And here's the most important part of the verse. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land or their marriage or their, their business problems or their financial mess or whatever. Time. God blesses repentance, Peter. And that's what he's looking for on the part of the believers in this nation right now. Amen. It's only hope we've got, brother. We, we have got to come to a deeper repentance. You know, we are either going to humble ourselves and start praying, or we will be humbled and we'll exactly be forced to pray, and then we're really going to be. That's right. Better to do it voluntarily before yeah. the ox falls. I mean, uh, you know, you cannot sin and get by. God is not mocked. And look at this man. That may. Well, that's the truth. That's that's the truth. truth. But it's positive. I mean, there's hope here. Yes. There's hope here. God says, if, if, if you do this, I'll take care of it. Just like he took care of those pilgrims, got them through the winter. Oh, where one, in one of your stories, they lived on five grains of corn. Came yeah. down to the derivation of five grains of corn. That's our heritage, and why throw it away? All right, that's right. Remember what Bradford said, that you not negligently lose what your fathers have obtained with such hardship. Amen. Amen. You're doing a terrific work, and uh, I'm going to ask the people out there to, would you pray for Peter Marshall? Oh, please. Uh, but God will use him. Uh, he has a ministry here putting his story back to his people so that they might pray, humbly pray and repent and turn from their wicked ways. And unless we do, our land will not be healed. That's true. At this time, we better face and we better do it. Peter, uh, I think we've got about a minute left. Anything you want to close with? Well, just to remember that we have a miracle-working God that, that loves this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pastor Peters, and you're listening to the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network. Take this down. Check out our network by going to sfawbn.com. And that website, you'll see all the different speakers and programs that we have on our network. That network is heard around the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by radio, shortwave radio, satellite, internet. We do a lot here at Scriptures for America, and we broadcast on the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network without commercials, without begging for money, without any money drives. But from time to time, we need to let you know uh, some money truths from the Word of God, and I'd like to share some with you right now. It's found in 
the ninth chapter of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I read, Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard 